It is Wednesday afternoon, August 2nd. Our year is rapidly flying by. I won't say any more negative about that. <laughs> but we will be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 25. We really finished 24 last week. We were looking at the overall picture. We finished off with the fact that Rebecca is a picture of the believer, the believer in Yeshua Jesus. We saw just hitting the highlight points real quickly that her marriage was planned long before she knew about it. Uh, this, you know, this is true of the believer also. She was necessary for the accomplishment and the completion of God's purpose. She was to share in the glory of the Son, capital S-O-N. She learned of the Son through her emissary, her paraclete, that's uh, names given to our comforter, our intercessor, our Holy Spirit. She immediately left all to go to the Son, loving Him before she saw Him, and rejoicing with unspeakable joy. I'm sure you can understand how to apply that one. She journeyed through the wilderness to meet the Son, guided by the servant. She was brought by the servant all the way to the Son. And she was loved by and finally united forever to the Son, our pre precious promise and hope as in the sure hope of our salvation, not the wishy-washy, I hope so. It's the no-so hope. So, secondly now, we'll see that Yitzhak, Isaac, her beloved, is a picture of Yeshua, of Jesus. So, he too was promised long before his coming. If I took you back to Genesis 15, 4, it would be when Abraham was promised a son and an heir. Yet, we know now it was 25 years later before Isaac was born. We see in our prophets that the coming uh, of, of Yeshua in the same way was promised long before he came. Micah, Micha, chapter 5 and verse 2 tells us that he comes from ancient, time of old. Let me just read it. It's better than me trying to summarize the Word of God. So I'm calling up Micah, Micha in the Hebrew chapter 5 and verse 2. It gave so much more than just the point I'm bringing out is why I'm trying to figure out how to summarize it. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So, long time promise. Yesha, Yeshahu, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We know that was long before it became a fact, which we read about in Luke, Luke chapter 1 and verse 68. In Luke 1 and verse 68, we will read, I have to scroll all the way down. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. He spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. I'm sorry, I missed the word as in there. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So the prophets spoke about the, the one who would come, the horn of our salvation, David's son, the one that, that would be um, sitting on his throne, that he would accomplish it for the redemption of Israel, again promised long before Yeshua came in the flesh, before Jesus was here in the flesh. But th in Luke, that's what Zechariah's prophecy was foreshadowing, was the coming birth that we read about in chapter 2 in verse Luke. Both Yitzhak and Yeshua, Jesus, finally appeared at the appointed time. I love that. God is never late, seldom early, and always on time. We see that, that he was promised in Bereshit in Genesis 18, 14. I'm going to go back there just real quickly uh, so that we can set that in our minds and understand what we're referring to. In 18, 14 we read, Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So God called it the appointed time. He had it planned. He had it planned from eternity past. He had it planned before he created this world. He had everything planned, and in him, it was as if it was done. 
That's amazing. But God had the exact time when he would be born. And then in chapter 21 too, you read that Yitzhak came at that appointed time. We read about that for our Messiah, our Savior, Yeshua Jesus in Galatians. If you go with me, and I'm sending you all over, if you're not good at turning pages quickly, no worries, I'll read it for you. Galatians chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5, and we read again, But when the fullness of the time came, or when the appointed time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So uh, both came at the appointed time. Both in their conception, it was miraculous. They were born miraculously. We know that Sarah was 90 and Abraham was 100. And both bodies were considered as good as dead for reproduction. So Yitzhak's birth was miraculous. It was not virgin born miraculous as was true for Yeshua Jesus but it still was miraculous out of dead bodies that God rejuvenated and we'll see how rejuvenated when we get into chapter 25 today also. But Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 tells us here um, and let me back up to 34 Mary uh, or in the English Miriam in our Hebrew said to the angel the angel just told her she was going to be the, the mother of Yeshua. Um, and she said, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. She, she, he, she was not going to have relations with Yosef, her, her betrothed. It was 100% miraculous, virgin-born birth. So both were conceived miraculously and born miraculously. Both Yitzhak, Isaac, and Yeshua, Jesus, were assigned an appropriate name by God before their birth. We saw that, that, that Sarah and Abraham were told they were going to have a son, and they were going to call him Yitzhak, laughter that we looked at many reasons why he was called that back when we studied it. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, we see here also that the, the name was picked out ahead. Uh, mom and dad, earthly mom and dads, didn't need to wonder for nine months what they were going to name their child or even the sex of their child. It wasn't an it, it was both in both cases male. Uh, Matthew 1 21 says she will bear a son and you shall call his name Yeshua Jesus in our English for he will save his people from their sins and Yeshua or Yahashua means God saves or the Lord saves so both were given their name before they were born both were offered up as in sacrifice by their fathers we know that uh, in Bereshit Genesis chapter 22 it's when Abraham was willing to sacrifice Yitzhak, put him on the altar, raised his hand with the knife, that God stopped it because he was not after that human sacrifice. But the picture was as if he had sacrificed him. And we know that Yeshua was, had come to do the will of the Father and was pleasing to the Father, and it was in the Father's will that he be sacrificed, that he could be the Redeemer for us, for all of mankind. We see in Bear, I'm sorry, in Yochanan, in John 3:16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only beloved Son. Now, did Yeshua have any issue? No, the same as Isaac. Both sons were 100% in agreement with the Father and willing, but we see the Father initiating. And then um, in Yesh Yeshahu, Isaiah 53. We see here very much a picture of Yeshua's willingness, and he lived this out. Jesus is the one I'm talking about. Isaiah 53 is a beautiful picture of the sacrificed Lamb of God. I'm just going to draw your attention to verses 4 and 5 and then 10. In 4 it says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Dropping down to verse 10, 
but the Lord was pleased to crush him. And this is the Lord crushing the Lord. You've got Jehovah you know, the Father and the Son in the picture here, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So the, the Lord was drawing a picture for us of the sacrifice. He was willing to be sacrificed, and in that sacrifice would become the living God, resurrected from the dead, the living Savior for uh, all mankind that uh, would bring this prosperity and satisfy the righteous one, as it goes on to say. So just trying to shorten it, read the whole chapter, and you'll see what I'm referring to. And in Bereshit 22, Yitzhak was obedient all the way to the point of death. He was willing also to lay down his life. Both father and son had to have expected, even if his life was taken, God would raise him again. We know that's true. Abraham will read that. In fact, I'll go ahead and read that to you. I'm a little ahead, but I'll read it since I'm saying it. In Hebrews 11, and Hebrews chapter 11, we'll read verses 18 and 19. This is our Hall of Faith chapter. If you need your faith encouraged, read it. If you're feeling sorry for yourself for your trials and tribulations, read it. And you might not feel like your problems are quite so bad. <laughs> Chapter 11, verse 18, it was he to whom it was said in Isaac, in Yitzhak, your descendant shall be called. He considered, this is Avraham, he considered that God is able to raise people from the dead from which he also received him back as a type. So Abraham considered it that if I kill my son, God will raise him from the dead, and yet it makes it clear that he received his son back only in type. He was not killed and resurrected, but we know Yeshua was put to death and resurrected. And uh, Philippians 2, 8 tells us that Yeshua, well, 5 through 8, to get the whole thought, humbled himself, willing to be obedient even to the point of death. And as I said, both were brought back from the dead, Isaac in type, Yeshua literally. Um, and they were brought back to be the head of a great nation. Isaac was to be the descendant that the promises would go through. He was going to be the head of the nation, as Abraham was. We know it, it passed down to his son, Yaakov, Jacob. We'll get to that in, in Genesis really before too long, believe it or not. <laughs> But they were both to be the head of, of a great nation because we know Yeshua is coming back to rule and reign on David's throne on earth in Jerusalem, fulfilling the earthly promises to the land of Israel. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 23 addresses and says, What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Messiah, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. That's where our victory was won. Through his death and his resurrection, he's now sitting at the right hand of the throne on high. But it says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. There's nothing above our Lord sitting on that throne in heaven. And God, he put all things in subjection under Yeshua's feet gave him as head over all things to the church or that called out assembly the church body which is his body the fullness of him who fills it all in all so yeshua being our head we being his body when he comes down to rule we are ruling with him but he is coming to be at the head of a great nation the nation of israel and to bless the entire world through that nation and finally we saw last week as we studied uh, Genesis chapter 24, Yitzhak was given a bride. He didn't go date, he didn't go hunt, he didn't go search. He was given a bride. Rebecca, Rivka was brought to him. And in Revelation 19, 7 and 8, we see that, that the bride has, uh, let me read it. I'm not good at summarizing today. I'm just going to read the scriptures and let the word of God speak for itself. He says it far better than I ever can. Revelation 19, we have the Lord coming back to stop the battle of Armageddon, coming back in his glory, and he will set up to rule and reign. 
but uh, as we're seeing this, this him coming out of the heavens, we read in verse 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. We know we're the bride of Messiah, of Christ. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. We wear his robe of righteousness so that we are seen righteous. And here we are coming back with him. Uh, we are his bride, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Sha'ol Paul, who is like the, the father of the called out assembly or the um, church family, um, whatever word fits in your book is okay in that. Some like church, some like called out assembly. 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Paul was saying, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband said to Christ, I may present you as a pure virgin. Paul was speaking to the church at Ephesus, and he was telling them, basically, he was jealous for them to stay pure and true to their God, to, to the Lord who he had, he had brought them into that relationship, they being the bride and him being the bridegroom, that they should be faithful to him, that they shouldn't go off into a, a relationship with anyone else an idolatrous relationship. And if we stay pure and true to the Lord and not go off into anything of anything that we put in his place, which is an idol, then we are that pure. We are that virgin that is to be presented in her beauty of her virginity to the Lord. So we see in the in all of this, we see such a picture of, of Yeshua Jesus, of us as bride we the believers we see the whole picture and it's very interesting that in genesis isaac was last seen at that place of sacrifice in chapter 22 that's where we last saw him verses 13 and 16. we don't see him again until he goes out to meet rebecca rivka now during that time he's not seen his name is frequently on the lips of his father avraham and of the servant who went to get a bride for, for Yitzhak. The servant we know we saw last week was a picture of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit for us. So Isaac's name was on God the Father's name on his mouth, in his mouth, and God the Holy Spirit in, in his work. And even Rebecca, the bride, we hear, we see, you know, she was learning about Isaac on the way. But it's very interesting the bridegroom was not seen from sacrifice to marriage he has come yeshua jesus he is he was seen sacrificed he was seen raised from the dead he was seen ascended into heaven but he's not seen again by the believing family until we're brought to him as the holy spirit brings us to our bridegroom that's when we see him so the next time we see our sacrificed, um, what can I say, our sacrificed bridegroom, I'll just say that, we'll see him when we're brought by the Holy Spirit to, to be with him forever. Just a beautiful picture to see. When we look at some of these pictures, we use the word dispensation to talk about times and how God gave pictures and, and lessons through different times. In chapter 22, we saw the picture of Messiah's crucifixion. That was the son being offered up. In chapter 23, we saw a picture of Israel. That was Sarah. Sarah represented Israel. She being the wife of the father, Israel the wife of Jehovah. In chapter 23, Sarah dies. We see a time that Israel's plan has been set aside. It's not the death of Israel. But the plan has been set aside. Chapter 24 comes in, and that's our picture of the Holy Spirit who is calling out a bride for his son and who is going to deliver her, the bride, to the son. That's chapter 24. I'll come back with some scripture references on that in a moment. Then chapter 25, when we pick up today, we're going to pick up with a picture of Israel restored. We're going to see that Abraham has a new wife. Now, it's not, you know, we can't go perfectly and say God had a wife called Israel. She died and God brought a new wife in. But God did set aside Israel's program 
when she rejected her Messiah and did not accept him. He brought in the program that is what's going on right now, the called out assembly. When we go to be with the Lord in heaven in rapture, he'll go on with his plan with Israel, bringing the wife back into the picture. Let me put it that way. So that we have a picture of Israel being restored and we have a picture of the kingdom because Abraham's going to go on and have children. Those children are not going to be the child of promise. That's Isaac. They're not going to be the heirs to the uh, Abraham's estate. And then Isaac's, it'll be Jacob's. It'll go on down, you know, through to the Messiah and beyond. But we do see in Matthew 22, in a parable form, we're told about a judgment that comes prior to the, the millennial kingdom. When the Lord comes back to rule on this earth and fulfill his promises to Israel, there are going to be human beings that go into the kingdom. They're going to be those who lived through the tribulation, who were believers, so they did not receive the mark of the beast. They did not side with the Antichrist. They stayed true and somehow managed to not get martyred before the end of the tribulation. They're going to be both Jewish and Gentile. Majority, well, I'm not even going to say majority because I don't know. <laughs> but they're going to be both going into the kingdom, and that's what will start to replenish this earth in human form during the kingdom. And that's what we're seeing a picture of, is the Lord will go on with his program with Israel. Israel will be head nation, but there are other nations. They will be blessed during this time also. So we get quite a picture of the different times that we see in what we call the dispensations of God's eternal plan through the ages. Now, let me back up because I wanted to make it clear and get my thought to the end for you. When we talk about chapter 24, the Holy Spirit calling out the bride and taking her home in rapture, we know that we use often 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 to prove our rapture verses. But I also wanted to show you Acts 15, 14. So let me take you there real quickly. Acts chapter 15. I can't type today. Okay. All right. I will get there. I could probably get there faster if I used um, my, my hard copy, but then it makes all kinds of noise. Acts 15, and I want us to look at verse 14, where we read, Shimon, Simon, had related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. What that's talking about is that plan where we call it the called out assembly, we call it the church, we call it, um, maybe I've given it its names anyway, that this plan that is made up mostly of Gentiles who come to believe. There are Jews mixed in there, I'm one. But it's mostly Gentile, that this plan to, to call out a people for his name out of the Gentile population was not an afterthought. It was not because, oh no, Israel didn't do what I want them to do, so what am I going to do? No, what is being said here is God had this in his plan, that before it would go on with what the prophets had foretold for Israel, there would be this other that would come in. Yeshua himself said, I have sheep of another pasture that you know nothing about when he was speaking to the Jewish nation. So my whole point is to show you, dear beloved Gentiles, you're not afterthoughts, you're not second class, you're not second choice. This was God's plan in the, the wholeness of his plan to use this time to provoke the Jews to jealousy and to follow through with his plan for all of mankind to be saved, that, that both Jew and Gentile can come to saving faith. Yes? Okay, did I understand correctly last week that um, the Jewish nation, you know, the large uh, conversion or salvation will not come until after the rapture? Right. The question is asked, did she understand correctly last week that I said that the Jewish nation as a whole coming to salvation in Yeshua, coming to recognize him as their Messiah, that will not come until after the rapture. Yes, that's correct. It really will not come until right at the end of the tribulation. That seven years of suffering, 
I back it up and look at their time in Egypt when they were in slavery and it says finally finally they groaned and they moaned and they cried out to their God send us a redeemer and he was able to send them Moshe they were finally ready to get back in that relationship with him through the tribulation suffering which is worldwide it's not just on the Jews it's on it's the wrath of God poured out on a sinful world but through that time of, of trouble and tribulation which is called the time of Jacob's trouble it, it, it it is what we read in Revelation. We know what goes on in Israel. And that is where it all culminates at the Battle of Armageddon in Israel. It's at that time when Israel as a nation, as a whole, finally cries out to her God. And will be pleading for God to redeem her. And then it's Zechariah says, they'll see the one that they pierced. They'll realize, wow, you are our Messiah. And in essence, they're bowing their head to him as Messiah then. That's when the nation will accept him as King Messiah and he will set up his kingdom. Where the first time when he came and he didn't set up that kingdom and he was working to deal with the sin issue and he wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. He wasn't breaking Rome's uh, uh, bondage over them. He wasn't bringing them that freedom. He wasn't setting up the kingdom. So they denied him as being Messiah, as being their king. No, you can't be because you didn't. And the rabbis would even say today, Yeshua couldn't have been our Messiah because he failed. He didn't set up the, the kingship and the, the rulership that is promised. Because they're looking only at those promises. They should have looked fully at the fact that God said Messiah would deal with sin and with reigning. R-E-I-N-G. R-E-I-G-N-I-N-G. -I but as a whole, Israel is blinded. As a whole, she will finally have that veil of blindness be removed and be crying that out right at the end of the tribulation. And then we go into the Millennial Kingdom. I forgot to bring you that chart. I need to bring the chart back out again, and maybe next week I can and just review it quickly because it lays out that time and helps us mentally see it. But um, I am, for sake of purpose right now in short, I am one who believes in the rapture prior to the tribulation. But even if you are one who believes that it's at the midpoint, it's still three and a half years after that before Israel as a whole will cry out to her Lord at seeing him as her Messiah. So right there at the end of tribulation, and then when they, the, the Lord has a judgment on earth, the sheep and goats judgment that you read about in Matthew, to see who goes into the kingdom, and then he tells other um parables that give other judgments that are right then too for the the believing gentiles that will go into the kingdom and the believing jews who will go into the kingdom they'll be both in the kingdom that it starts out with and again they were saved after the rapture not not prior before can we try to bring it up real fast or not try what can we try to bring it up real fast or not you have the chart i think so you gave it to me a while back Oh, okay, I don't remember I did. Sure, if you can find it and bring it up and share it, then go ahead. But at the same time, um, are you clear? Are you okay? Yeah, I had one more thought. Okay, go ahead with your thought. And Rhonda, I know you've got something, but I'll let Patty finish hers, and then I'll come to you. So go ahead. Okay, so for the people who are not raptured and that are left here, they're going to need a tremendous amount of grace oh, right, yes. to reject the... The ship and all that stuff. Right. Does it, do you know, does it say anywhere in the Bible that God will give them all that grace or how he will help them? It's a, what Patty's saying is after, well, after, we're going to say after the rapture, and if you want my, why I believe in pre, I have that in other teachings. Let me know and I'll make sure you get connections to it. But she's saying after the rapture has occurred, for those who get saved after, who are living during the time of tribulation, they're going to need extra grace, extra help, because how horrible it's going to be during that time for them to, to be able to withstand not taking the mark of the beast, going against the, the, the flow, knowing it could mean their martyrdom. She's saying, is there anything in Scripture that tells us that God's meeting them, giving them more grace? And I'm frantically trying to think of a verse in my mind, I think of the thoughts. I think of what we see represented. We know that God raises up 144,000 that are sealed so they cannot be harmed until their ministry is done. 
They carry the gospel out to the ends of the earth. If God has sealed them and protected them to do their duty, then obviously God's working in a way to, uh, to enable those who are coming into his family to withstand. It is a time when scripture does say if it were possible, even the believers would be, um, what's the word, confused, would be um, deceived. Now it says, if it were possible, they cannot be, the truth cannot be deceived to the believer because the Holy Spirit will keep them and give them the truth that they need to stand. I think the closest I can get to answering you, and if anybody thinks of a scripture, I'm open to, to the input, but I think we just have to look at those who have been martyred for their faith. We've seen them have a, a stamina, a strength, a grace, a, you know, something more than what we know personally ourselves. And calm. And calm. A calmness, yeah. yes. That they don't go screaming into their martyrdom. Stephen, our first martyr, his face is aglow. Well, he's literally being stoned to death. He sees heaven open up. The glory of the Lord's all over him. And even, I think if I remember right, I think even says, you know, the Father don't hold this to their charges. He's even forgiving those who are killing him right on the spot. I think we could all go through story after story after story exemplifying it. Um, so we, we know it. We know that, that the same way that Scripture tells us that, that the Lord will meet us with anything we need, that you know, he, he is what we need, and when we draw on Him, we have whatever we need. In that same way, those Scriptures are still applicable for the believer of any age. You know, we've got, if you can read it, the uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, we've got martyrdom all the way through, and it, all, all the way back with the prophets of old being martyred, with those in Yeshua's day and forward being martyred, that it, it's just blood alley is what comes to my mind. But yet, all the way through, we see each one of those that, that if you can read it, you don't read it, if any of them, like Roger's saying, in a panic. You don't see, you know, something... <laughs> You know what they're going through is horrendous, but they seem to be above it. They seem to be able to withstand what's happening. And I think of when Corey Tim Boom was so afraid, um, knowing that you know they were they were hiding Jews, knowing that the threat any day they could be carried off, and they were. They were um, somebody mm -hmm. gave them up, and they were found out, and they went into the concentration camps to suffer the same consequences as the Jews for their part in rescuing Jews. And she was so afraid, and she said to her papa how scared she was. He said to her, Corey, when we're going to go somewhere, when do I give you the train ticket? Do I give it to you here in the house? And she says, no, papa. He says, do I give it to you on the way while we're walking to this train station? No, papa. Do I give it to you while we're waiting for the train on the, at the train station? No, papa. You give it to me right when I step on the train. And he said, that's what God will do. When you need, you will have. He may not give it to you ahead, but you will have what you need. Again, I'm fighting for scripture to come to my mind, but I see the principle all the way through. That, you know, that's just who our Lord is. Um, and we see it in modern time. We see 16-year-old Rachel Scott with a gun in her face in the library at her school. Three months prior, she had given her heart back to the Lord. Three months she wrote in her journal of her love for the Lord. And when the question was asked if she was a believer in Jesus, she knew in that instant what it would mean. And for a 16-year-old to face a gun and have the, the chutzpah in my Hebrew, my Yiddish, to say, yes, I believe in Jesus, and have her life taken. There's your modern day example. How does a 16-year-old do that? That's not, you know, a tough. It's, it's the Lord. Hey. It's the Lord. So, the one, go ahead, Roger. Um, the one thing, too, you were talking about Corrie Boone. Later in life, when she was giving a speech, and that's that not soldier came up, that's yeah. someone similar to it, because she still had, God had to come over her and oh, give yeah. her True enough, true enough. The ability for her to forgive the soldier that she knew had, had done a lot of harm to them and even was the one responsible for killing her sister. And yet, in her own flesh, she said she couldn't forgive, but the Lord took over. In that same way, them facing their martyrdom, the Lord takes over in some way. Maria, do you have an answer to that? 
Yep. Wait, 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 wait. Keep trying. Keep trying. Roger's working on it too. There you go. You know, you know that the, the uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, what really came to mind is Exodus 33, 19. Okay. Can you, you read know, it for us? They said, and he, and he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. So, you know, I think this would be appropriate to what you were saying, because that God knows, and but no one is going to tell God when. <laughs> or, Okay. Or to whom. Okay. Yeah, and that was God revealing himself to Moshe when Moshe had asked for that. But that does show us who he is. So I like yes. your application. I like the way that, that you're saying it. And all the way through I just nothing in scripture tells me against that. Everything says I'll never leave you, I'll never abandon you, I'll never forsake you, you know, I'm with you. When you are weak, I am strong. You know, look at the Psalms. How many times David was down in the pits and then he'd say, Oh my soul. You know, why are you depressed? You know, look up mm -hmm. at your salvation. So, yeah, uh, it, it, we see it in principle. Yes, Dora. Uh, since, we're, since we're talking about Carrie Boone, uh, there's a movie coming out about her. I just heard of a, a new movie on Corey Ten Boom coming out? Okay, there's stay also tuned. A new biography on her, too. Okay, and a new biography. All right, there's a lot <coughs> of good ones out there already in book form. Um, and there has been one movie, but be interesting to see what's coming so stay tuned Rhonda you have been most patient <laughs> I did not forget you I just wanted to be able to you know complete those thoughts but what would you like to ask or add can you no. get a Roger there we go okay nothing maybe it was just a spin off of, of the scripture Acts 15, 14, where we say mostly Gentiles, uh, where we called out to carry out his name. I, I've heard two different arguments, but I seem like a, a, my question is very s simple, and I think I have the right answer, I just want to ask it. The first Christians were Jewish people, weren't they? Absolutely. They were disciples. Absolutely. Yeah, I heard someone say, no, the first Christians were, I mean, you know, you know the word, but sometimes when you hear something crazy, you just got to get confirmation that the first Christian were what the disciples were. right right the first believers were his Talmudim that he had trained Peter James John the other the, the other the, that had followed the women who were circled around with Yeshua Mary Magdalene that there were a number of Marys even his mother his brother James came to be a believer they are the ones that assembled and uh, as the church is born in Acts 7 um, you have the end of the offering of the kingdom, that's with the martyrdom of Stephen, and that's where God, in essence, is saying, okay, I've offered you and offered you and offered you, that's, you know, four times you see the kingdom offered and rejected from Acts 1 to Acts 7, then it's where God, is, in essence, is saying, okay, I'll put aside that plan, notice my words, I'm not cutting it off, I'm not throwing it in the garbage, I'm not replacing it, I'm putting aside that plan. And I'm going to go on with this other plan. I'm going to call out this other people that I had planned all along so that you, Israel, can get good and jealous. Because you're going to see my eyes over here toward them. You're going to see my blessings on them. You're going to see that they honor your scriptures. And so he calls out the Gentile to make the Jew jealous. But the church, who Paul, when Paul started the churches, he go looking for those who were praying. For those who were worshiping God, he would bring the truth in, and the first churches were Messianic. In fact, in our complete Jewish Bible, it calls them the Messianic congregation of Ephesus. The Messianic congregation of, and it names the others, because he took the gospel, as Romans 1.16 says, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. He went to those who had the start, who had everything foreshadowed, who had everything in the bud, and brought them the truth that Messiah Yeshua Jesus is that fulfillment here's your flower and that's why I love to call it Judeo-Christianity that's really what it is he didn't cut off Judaism but Judaism became fulfilled in Christianity 
what the law was pointing toward, now salvation, was through the grace of Messiah's sacrifice. What all those sacrifices were for, now it's been done. Now there's permanent blood on the mercy seat in heaven forever. No more need of sacrifices. No more need of anything else. He didn't start a new plan. He fulfilled, he completed what had been set into motion. So it's only natural that those are the people and why you've got your book of Hebrews speaking to the Hebrew people to go on in Messiah. Don't shrink back to just the law. Go on into that fulfillment. Those were the ones who were being called. Those were the ones who, who the church was being established on. It was the Gentiles that were coming into that. They were called God-fearers. They were Cornelius. Paul, uh, Peter had to have the vision of the sheet of the non-kosher animals and God telling him, don't call it non-kosher if I call it kosher. And, and then there's the knock on the door and it's the Gentile. And Peter goes, oh, I get it. I don't call the Gentile non-kosher now. The Gentile's going to be able to come in also. We're going to be one family together. But it started with those who were believing in the one true and living God of Israel. The Gentiles were called, in our Greek, they're called heathen. They're called barbarians because they were out in idolatry and false worship. They had to come in to first to proselyte into Judaism before Messiah had come and shed his blood. But they came into what, what we'll call the original covenant. They came into what the law and the prophets had told. Now as the church is being formed, it's not being a new religion, and I hate it being called that. It's a continued, completed relationship. The God of Israel is bringing in the Gentiles into the, the, this family where they're now called the bride of his Messiah, of his Savior. Not the bride of a Gentile Jesus. He's not Gentile. He's Jewish. You know, I think that's what they forget and what mm -hmm. the, the church world today doesn't remember. Sadly, what happened through history is you had those in Judaism and those in Christianity butting heads and fighting with each other. And both sides have guilt on their sides as to right and wrongs of what were being done. But by the time you get to the third century, by the time you get to the time of Constantinople and others, they wanted to remove anything Jewish because in their mind, those bad Jews rejected their Messiah. They're cursed. Now, God did not say that. They, they said it. And so they felt anything Jewish was bad. So they went so far as to set laws in motion that if you went to a Passover, you could be put in jail. So those of you who come to my Messiah in the Passover, if you lived in that time, you could have gone to jail for coming and learning about how this was a picture of Messiah. They cut off every bit of Jewishness of, of the scriptures as they could. And they went forward with a Gentile-flavored Christianity. They still had truth in there. They were still looking at Jesus as Savior, but you weren't hearing Jesus as Messiah and Savior. You're just hearing Jesus as Savior. As the church grew out away from the Jewish nucleuses, Jerusalem, Alexandria had a great Jewish population, but as, as the, they moved further out and as time moved on <clears throat> with the, the anti-Semitism that was there also, and even in the church fathers, I'm sorry folks, but it's there. From the 60s on, A.D., you have anti-Semitism being preached from the pulpit. You have the Jews being condemned and, and that the, they should be killed and they should, it's, it's horrible. But as they moved away from the having Jewish people in leadership especially and in the body, then they didn't know the Jewishness of the scriptures anymore and they carried on a very Gentile flavored Christianity so that we get to the point where we're here in the 21st century and you all are coming into my teaching saying, give us the Jewish stuff. Give us that background. Give us the roots of our salvation. Give us that fullness of meaning. I understood in John that he was called the Lamb of God, but now that you tell me and show me from Exodus forward, it's like, wow, what a picture. 
you know, it's, it's kind of like a lot of people jumped into junior high without ever having elementary school. And when they got into trouble, somebody came in and showed them, here, you need to go back to the basics. You need to learn your beginning roots. Now they're going, oh, okay, now it all clicks. It all makes sense. And so we've gone forward to the point that I can see the pendulum beginning to swing back. And the Jewishness of the scriptures is coming into more and more of the Gentile churches now. There are still those who don't accept it. There are still those who anathemize us. There are still those who think, no, you can't be Jewish and a Christian. And I, I tell them, how can believing in a Jewish Messiah make me Gentile? Explain that one, please. Because I was born Jewish. You may have been born Italian or Spanish or Korean or Filipino or whatever. What can you do in your life to change what you were born? Nothing. So not only can I not change because my Jewishness is not Judaism. Those are two different words. But if I'm accepting the Jewish Messiah who's teaching the Jewish scriptures and fulfilling the Jewish scriptures and going on with the Jewish plan, if anything, I'm going to be more Jewish, not less Jewish. <laughs> but here's the battle. And here's where we have to teach. And here's where we have to climb over the hurdles of those who've been taught to anathemize the Jews. Because I've heard it from dear Christian brethren. You know, oh, the Jews killed Christ. I want nothing to do with the Jews. And I've had doors slammed in my face for that. And I don't say that for any sympathy for me. I've not suffered like my Jewish um, um, ancestors have. I've not, believe me. I, life has been great for me. <laughs> so I'm not saying that for sympathy, but it breaks my heart when I hear it and when I see it. And if you don't think it's around you, my close friend at the time walked into a Staters on 40th Street when there was a setup for Passover at the time. Two women walking in the door together. The one looked at my friend, didn't know my friend was a Jewish believer, and saw that Passover and said, Look at that. I can't believe they're bringing in things for the Jews right here in this store. I'm going to tell the manager I don't want to see that in my store because those Jews killed Christ and they should have nothing to do, you know. And my friend just caught deer in the headlights but did look at her and said, I'm Jewish. And the woman just, ugh, and stormed off. <laughs> that was, you know, a few years back, but that's in my lifetime. It's still around. Sadly, it's still around. But she never knew you were Jewish people? You friends? The, the one who said that, I don't know who that person was. She walked in with, uh, I'm trying to leave names off, but I don't think it'll hurt. Cindy was a Jewish believer. And she walked in tandem into the store with Cindy. Didn't know Cindy from Adam. Thought she'd get a sympathizer of those bad Jews. You know, and and didn't. And the, in in other religions, they teach them that also. One very close has days to anathemize the Jewish people, that uh, talk about the the bad Jews from Scripture, and they'll pull out Judas was a Jew, you know, and they'll burn an effigy of him and say, you know, they're burning the Jewish people, and it goes on. That's today. But uh, but the roots are there. The truth is there. The first church was made up of Jewish believers. Then Gentiles mixed in. Then time moves on and you get a further way, like I say, from the Jewish traditions and all. You've had the destruction of the temple. You have the persecution of the Jews. There were those who were afraid who hid it. And then you keep moving down and further and further away till it, it gets lost. How many Jewish people today are finding out, I've got Jewish blood. It was back there with my great-great-grandparents, but they didn't pass it down to us. And if they get an answer as to why, and majority don't, but if they do, it's almost always we were afraid of the persecution. So we hid the fact that we had Jewish blood so that you could grow up. Mm -hmm. You know, I had somebody that came from, um, I don't remember where, Eastern Europe, and the family moved to America. They were raising their daughter but they were so afraid the Holocaust was going to come to America. This is in, she's probably close to my age, so, you know, in the 60s and 70s. They hid her by putting her in a Catholic school and told her, it's not for you. Don't believe the Bible they teach you. We'll teach you right at home. 
but don't tell the school you're Jewish. Hide it. You're never allowed to say outside of this home you're Jewish. And they kept all their practices within the home. She grew up with that. She said, I fell in love with Jesus. When I heard about him at school, I fell in love with him. And I even came home one day and I told my mama, I want Jesus. And she told me, no, 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 no. Jesus is the Gentile God. We don't have Jesus. And she pointed her back to their Judaism. Well, let her grow up a few more years. Let her be an adult. She's on her own. She was very disturbed by circumstances in her life one night. Went to sleep with the radio on, on a station of music just to soothe her and woke up in the morning to hearing this Jewish music pour out. Well, my dad's radio messages, evangelistic in nature, would start with a Jewish song called Ele Ele, very well known by the Jewish people at that time. She heard that, caught her interest, and so she started listening. And my dad in his message said, this is good news for Jews. This is good news for Gentiles, and his coined word, Jew tiles too, part Jewish, part Gentile. She listened through the whole half hour, and when he repeated at the end that um, pleading with people to open up their heart to Jesus as Messiah and Savior, no matter whether they were Jewish or Gentile, whatever, that it didn't matter, she was so excited, she said, I can have Jesus too? <laughs> and she opened her heart and received the Lord. Didn't tell us the full story immediately, but did get in touch with us, and we saw her grow in the Lord. But here she was hidden. She even knew her Jewishness, but still was to hide it and didn't realize the, you know, to me it's the perfect blend. It, it's the Reese's peanut butter cup. We've got the chocolate and the peanut butter, folks. We brought it together, and it's better together. <laughs> so I'm a little off, but I hope it answers questions. It is important for you all to see your Gentile churches have Jewish roots. Your faith has Jewish roots. That's what you're here learning from me. What you're embracing is the Jewishness of your faith. It's one root. That root that goes all the way down that everything comes and springs out of, that root, that's Yeshua. That's Jesus. You don't have to call him Yeshua. I use that name because any of my Jewish brethren who are hearing me, I want them to hear it in a, a format that's easy on their ear to hear and to understand where to them they've heard so much suffering in the name Jesus or Christ that it turns them off. So I use the Hebrew name to help them identify his Jewishness and to listen to my whole message. Don't shut it off. Don't be afraid of it. Check it out. Search me out. Prove me wrong. I know a lot of books written by Jewish people who are now believers in Yeshua Jesus, who set out to prove that Jewish person wrong, <laughs> the Jewish believing person wrong. So, did I cover it all? Okay, and it, I think this is very important and it's very fitting for our time here. And I stress this also of chapter 25, what we're going into of Abraham getting a new wife, having children, of them coming into blessings also, not the blessing, not the fulfillment down to Messiah, but they're also, you know, they're, they're going to receive gifts you're going to see as soon as we get into chapter 25. But that's important because when it's a picture of Israel being restored, this is what I have to teach loud and long, and you all need to be quick to be able to defend it. It's teaching against what's called replacement theology, which says God's done with the Jews. He's done with Israel. When they rejected their Messiah, he threw them aside and he raised up the new, which is the church, and he gave it all to the church now, all those promises to the church. And that's nothing but a lie out of the pit of hell. He does bring both Jew and Gentile to be joint heirs with him, to receive his, when we're heirs of him, everything that's his is ours. That's our future, but never, he says time and again through the original um, scriptures, through the prophets, time and again, that he would never make a full end of Israel that he would sit on Israel's throne, that he would bless Israel as head nation, that they would receive all these blessings that have been promised. So if he is going to suddenly change his mind, take all of that, give it to the church, and not give it to Israel, and oh, by the way, they don't take any of Israel's curses for disobedience with them. They only take her blessings when they're over there stealing it away. But if he could do that, then I would say, as a believer in Jesus for salvation, uh-oh, I know I'm saved today, 
But what if the Lord takes it away tomorrow and turns it another way? Will I be saved? And I would live in fear if he were a God who changes his mind, pulls back on his promises, doesn't keep his word. No, my God is faithful. He is faithful to the dotting of the I's, the crossing of the T's, write the check, sign, signed by God, and go bank it. Pull it out and be blessed by it. But it's very, very important that we realize that and not teach that Israel is done and not teach that there is a replacement because, uh, again, then, then shaking your boots, folks, because we got a God who's one way today and another way tomorrow, and yet immediately the scripture comes to mind, I'm fighting for the reference, but Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I believe it's in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 13.8, let's check her out. She thinks she's got it, and I, she could be right. It sounds right to me. Um, and this is why I learn your addresses. You can't get to the house if you don't know the address, folks. <laughs> um, you got it. A plus to Patty. In my complete Jewish Bible, Yeshua the Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in our English, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And by the way, while I'm on it, let me point out, Jesus is not the first name and Christ the last name, like I'm Rochelle Pearl. Everybody thinks that too. Oh, that's his name. He's Jesus Christ. No, Jesus is Yeshua, God saves. That's our Hebrew. And Christ means the anointed one. It's a title. Yeshua Jesus is the anointed one. Who anoints? God anoints. He's anointed of God to carry out salvation to the world. That's who he is. So he doesn't have a first and last name. He has a first name only. And it, it is Yeshua, Yahushua. It is Jesus in English. We see his attributes and all his other names that come in. Right now in, in our parasha, we're studying the fact that he calls himself the jealous God, El Kanah. He's jealous for us. He's jealous for Israel. He's jealous for his church body. He's jealous for, for those to come to faith in him and to love him wholly and be that pure virgin that doesn't go idolatrous on him, doesn't become an adulteress like Hosea's wife did, even though that too was a picture of Israel who would be brought back. But um, all of this is so important, so important. And please know how to defend it. That's why I'll go through it again and again and again, because you need to be able to stand on the word of God for your proof. And it is important because... Uh, uh, our Jewish people do not want anything that, in their mind, turns them from being who they are. Then they're a traitor. And that's what they'll think of me because I have my faith in my Messiah, but I go long and hard to show and prove to them I didn't change when I was born. Couldn't if I wanted to. If I was born a Jew, I'll die a Jew. My dad being, being witness to ten and a half years into it, tells the one witnessing to him, I was born a Jew, I'll die a Jew. And the answer of the believer who was witnessing to him said, good, die a saved Jew. <laughs> and he was so right. That's all you change. You were born a Filipino, you'll die a Filipino, but die a saved Filipino. You know, whatever relationship you want to put in there, you know, complete it in your salvation in Yeshua Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who outside of his human form, has no nationality. It's the human that has the Jewishness. Yes. Has there always been a Messianic Jews in, in Jerusalem? God has always kept a remnant. They, they sometimes have been very small in number, but he's always kept a remnant. question was asked, has there always been Messianic believers? And, and yes, through time, God has always kept a remnant. Said he would, and he has faithfully. Can I point it all out to you? I'm not good enough in history, but yes, you can go in and you can find it, that it's there. So even even as we see the churches moving out and away, there were still Jewish believers. You know. And it's funny that, that you say that too, because so many Jewish people, when they're getting saved, you know, they, or they just come to salvation, my dad was one, I've met others the same way, they think, wow, I'm the only Jew on the face of the earth that's come to believe. <laughs> and they get to find out now there's there's always a few more of us around than just the one but God said he would always keep a remnant and he has so, yeah. began to say that about a guy that was 
back east with a radio station or something like that he didn't work with. Then the guy was, when the guy did get saved, he was, he's Jewish, and he said, I had no idea that there were other Jews like me that were looking. And anyway. Yeah, I've Christians. heard it time and again. <laughs> I was even at Biola Bible College, and the speaker was Ann Kimmel Anderson. If you know her, she's not popular today, but she was a popular speaker back then. And here we are, we're like 2,000 kids in the gym, that's where we had chapel. And just close to her finishing her message, she happened to mention, she had a few people with her that day, and she said, I even have one, he's Jewish, he just two weeks ago came to believe in, in Jesus as his Savior. And he thinks, you know, he's the only Jewish one who has, but we're showing him he's not. And of course, the whole, the whole uh, gym has gone wild over the fact he's saved. But at the, as soon as that chapel was over, this little Jewish girl beelined it all the way across that gym, straight to him. Everybody else is going to Anne. I headed straight for him. I, I wanted him to face to face, and I want to give him a copy of my dad's testimony too. Here's another, just like you, out of Orthodox Judaism. I'm Jewish. I believe it in Jesus, and I still see him just light up when I talk to him. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. So, you know. Um, but again, um, what a picture we have. If there's not other questions or comments, I will move forward. Yes, Patty. Uh, just that I, in the Bible, right before he moved to me, uh -huh. it says, I will never fail you or abandon you. Therefore, we stay with confidence. And I is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can a human being do to me? Amen. So, Amen. that implies grace, right? You have to remember that one. Yes, yes. She just read, if you couldn't hear it, Hebrews 13, starting with verse 6, where the Lord said, sorry, verse 5, where the Lord said he would never fail or abandon. And uh, it, she read it from the complete Jewish Bible, so it brings it out as Adonai, the Lord, who is, is our helper. And there's nothing we can fear when he's on, when we're on his side, he's on our side, however we, I should put that, yeah. You had a thought. Before too, did you get to bring out your other thought? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. If if anything comes back, we can open discussion later. But uh, okay, let me ask you again. Are this remnant that you're talking about is these the people like they believe in God through the whole um, the generations for like we see in Noah's line, Shem believed. Yeah. And we see in Jacob's line, you know, it continue on. We see that, and yes, that's what we're saying, that there's, that he always kept some who were Jewish who believe. He knows, even people who don't know they're Jewish are counted among that. And that's what, so, it just blows my mind. Okay, 144,000 are raised up in the tribulation to be Jewish evangelists. If you don't believe they're Jewish, then tell me why in two different chapters God goes through and spells out 12,000 out of the tribe up, 12,000 out of the tribe up, 12,000 out of the tribe up, and he names those tribes. Now, if they're not of those tribes, why did he spell it out that way? Obviously, obviously they're Jewish. Now, ask me what tribe I'm from. What tribe are you from? I don't know. <laughs> I have my guesses. I know what my mom and my dad used to like to say, but we have no proof because the records of our heritage were destroyed in 70 AD. From 70 AD on, the only one that could really prove what tribe they're from is one called Cohen or Levi because both those words have to do with the priestly tribe. Levi, obviously, from the tribe of Levi, and Cohen means priest, and they were the priestly tribe. So a Levi or a Cohen today can pretty much say, hey, I know what tribe I'm from, but the rest of us don't know. There can be hearsay that's been passed down. There can be hope so's. There can be ideas. But if you ask us to prove records, none of us can. That's also why... Messiah had to come before 70 AD because he had to be able to prove his heritage, that he was of the line that he had to be of. He had to be able to show that his pedigree came down through David, through Jacob, you know, through the whole promise. That's why Matthew gives it extensively. 
That's why other places refer to it also. But I love that God knows where we are. And he knows how to keep those lines pure enough that there's at least enough percentage of that tribe in that person to call them from that tribe. So in my mind, they're not, you know, they're not 10% um, the tribe of Naphtali. They're 90%, if not 100%. How did God keep that through the years to bring up 144,000 now? Because he's God. Because he's able. Because he keeps the lines. Because he is working in every detail. So when he calls out 12,000 out of the tribe of Naphtali and out of the tribe of God and out of the tribe of Asher and all the others, he's calling them out according to their bloodline. Blows me away. And I love the fact, and then I'll go to you, Rhonda. DNA is beginning to find out more and more about where, where we're from. And I've told you before, they came out with the fact that all Jewish people come from four mamas. And when I heard that, I just burst out laughing. They're proving the Bible. Because where do we get the four mamas? We get the four mamas from who did Jacob have as wives? Leah and Rachel. The 12 tribes came out of Leah and Rachel, but not those two alone, came out of their two concubines, Bilhah and Zilpha. Now you've got four mamas who produced 12 sons who are called the heads of the 12 tribes. So when DNA said, oh, they come from four, four mamas, it said, yeah, Rachel, Leah, Zilpha, and Bilhah. You got it right, DNA. Will they get smart enough to be able to pick out some sort of factors that show Ephraim and Naphtali and Issachar and Judah? I don't know. I don't know, but I know God knows. So it doesn't matter what man knows, but it just blows my mind. We've got such a magnanimous God that he's kept the line. He's kept a Jew to this day. He, they've never been 100% annihilated. And how many times has Satan tried to? right up through the Holocaust and after it still. He's still trying. He still thinks he can wipe out the whole Jewish population. What's he put in the heart of Israel's enemies today? Not just to get her land, but to push her into the sea. You know, the only good Jew is a dead Jew, according to, to the Palestinian authorities and all of the others that, that are in those positions. Bet God. Bet God. And that's my proof today to any atheist that wants to say, prove me God, I'll point you a Jew. Wouldn't be a Jew if there wasn't a God. Rhonda, I gotta get off my soapbox. This is what always confuses me. You said that you are a Jew if you don't know which tribe you're from. So I thought the 12 tribes equals the Israelites. The 12 tribes were the Israelites. And it's been passed down to us that we have been born with Jewish blood. My dad was born into an Orthodox Jewish home. He was raised knowing he's Jewish, but he doesn't know what tribe. He just knew he was Jewish because the family passed down their Jewishness. But that's why there's a lot of people who are Jewish that don't even know it because the families hid it or lost it and didn't even pass it down. But the DNA testing shows chromosomes or whatever, this is where it's beyond me, that show the Jewish traits. And I know when I was answering a questionnaire about certain things, it popped up and, and asked me, you know, are you of Jewish descent? So there are certain traits that are there that mark it, the same way that, that traits show you to be, and how do I say it right without offending you, Rhonda? Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, I love this it. Is my, my confusion is how they interchange Jew for Israelites, because Israelites equals the, equals the 12 tribe, and Jew equals the Judah people. Okay, right? okay. Then take That's history why down. Confusion. Sure. How they use the words interchange. Sure. When you have Abraham, and soon we're going to see it, he's called a Syrian. Okay, I have to pause between that. He's a capital S-Y-R-I-A-N, is Syrian, not Assyrian, because that's a whole other nation. He came from the area of Padan Aram, and that's the, the place between the two rivers. It's an area that the people who came from there were called Syrians. He's not Jewish. That's why when people say, oh, I'm Jewish because my father Abraham was Jewish, I have to say, well, I know what you mean, 
and, and you're welcome into the family, but you're not Jewish. Abraham wasn't Jewish. So we have him being a Hebrew. Hebrew means crossed over. Crossed over the river, literally. Crossed over from idolatry into worship of the one true and living God. His son Isaac is the first one where we get Israelite. And through Isaac, you have Jacob, and you have the 12 tribes being born. They're still being associated as Israelites because they came from the area of Israel. We're Americans because we come from America. That doesn't mean that I was born in Utah or Washington or New York. It just means that I, I have America, American roots, the 50 states, okay? Israelites, they came from Israel. Then you have Jacob. By the time Jacob's sons are all born, you've got all the different tribes. The ten northern tribes get to be known as the northern kingdom. Benjamin and Judah get to be known as the southern kingdom. Judah was the bigger out of those two. By the time Judah is going off into captivity, the ten northern tribes have already gone and been swallowed up by the country called Assyria. And then Babylon swallows up Assyria, swallows up Benjamin and Judah, so the ten tribes are now all under, I mean twelve tribes are now all under Babylonian rule. That's why there's no lost tribes. They were all mixed in there again. But you have the Judah being, uh, when the, the southern kingdom um, was just Judah and Benjamin, Judah being the stronger, the older, the more powerful, his name became like the family name. And they, were, they would say the Jews came from the tribe of Judah. You'll hear Netanyahu today say that the Jews come from Judea the area called Judea. You have Jerusalem, you have Judea, you have Samaria, you have, you know, beyond. Netanyahu will pull it down specifically and say we're calling the Jews the ones who come from Judea. I still have a little argument with him because there's more than just those who came from Judea, but I agree. Judeans became called Jews. Those from the tribe of Judah became known as Jews. But as the tribes all went into captivity, by the time they come out of captivity, they're now giving the name more general to all of the tribes, and they're all being known as those Jews. So Jew is what continue to be carried down, even to this day. So I can be any of the 12 tribes and called a Jew today, even though originally it should have been just the tribe of Judah that got nicknamed shorter Jew out of Judah. But it just, it just didn't hold that way. So, again, if you look at 50 states and you're all American, look at 12 tribes and you're all Jews. Yeah, but, but that's where the name originated was with Judah. And prior to that, it went down the couch, Roger. Prior to that, it's Israel, Israelites. Yeah. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Sure. Any other questions, comments? Okay, are you two still comfortable? Okay, starting to warm up over here, but if you're fine, I'm fine. <laughs> okay, they're not asleep on me by any means. I think our class has been interactive enough that we've all stayed with it. Um, okay, so I think I've given you the scriptures and proved what I wanted. I have one more note prior to starting chapter 25. We will start it. But through Yitzhak and Rivka, Isaac and Rebekah, they're going to have sons that continue Abraham's line. Abraham, Isaac, they're going to have sons that go on down. We're going to see specifically, it's going to be through one of their sons that's going to carry on down to the line of the Messiah. I think you all know his name? Jacob. Jacob, yeah. Okay. Now, um, after the Bride of Christ the church, the called out assembly, after we're taken to our new home, joined our bridegroom, then we're going to see that God begins to focus again, I'll put it that way, main attention on Abraham's seed, on those who came down who make up what's called the Jewish people of today, proving that God was not through with Israel. That's why we see when he marries again, we see it as like the wife being restored. Now, in, in the case of Abraham, Sarah didn't come back from the dead. I don't want you to misunderstand. But Israel wasn't completely dead. Israel's just set aside temporarily. 
but now the focus is going to come back. Let me show you that God is not through with Israel. And if he ever is through with Israel, then with all respect to my God, I would have to say my God is a liar then. And you know I do not say that disrespectfully. He is anything but. My God has never lied, will never lie, and I can trust that fully 100%. So when I go to my prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah in my Hebrew, I go to chapter 31, and I go to verse 35. I read, and by the way, prior to these verses, God's talked about a new covenant that he would make with the house of Israel. And that's what we know is the what I'll call Judeo-Christianity. That new covenant is the blood of Yeshua Jesus put on the, the altar for the forgiveness of sins forever. Never a need of a sacrifice of a lamb, never the need of an earthly high priest again. It's done. It's fulfilled in Yeshua as high priest and being the lamb of God. So all that's prior to verse 35, but in Jeremiah 31, 35, this is when God says he's done with Israel. Says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that his waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Adonai Savaot is his name. If this fixed order departs, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the waves, if that departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. Anyone see the sun today? Yes. I'm feeling the sun right now. <laughs> Did anyone see our full moon last night? No. It is a full moon, 25,000 miles closer to Earth than usual, so it's really big. It just happened to be on Tuba Off, the holiday of love that I taught on this weekend, that takes place at the full moon, and that uh, ties into Jewish history. It just, just happens to... I went outside, and I couldn't see it because it was so overcast. Uh, we had clouds around it, but I saw it. I saw it big and huge, but I saw it a lot later than you because I know when you go yeah, to bed. I went <laughs> and I went out a little late, so it was higher in the sky. I want to go out earlier tonight just to see it because of how close it is. But I try nine-ish. I would try that, yeah, and see. Even, even, I don't know how soon it really gets dark now. Once it's good and dark, start looking because the the lower it is in your horizon, the bigger you'll see. But I. Obviously, some of us saw the moon. Anybody see stars last night? I'm, I don't, not sure I did because of the overcast, but I know there were stars out there last night. Anyone been to the ocean recently where there's still waves? Do you think the waves are gone? Are you worried about it? High tide. High tide on the news last night. This, this flooding cities or, or towns or whatever I should call them. Obviously, we don't have an end to those things. God said, when those end, then I'll make an end of Israel. So here's his promise that he is not done with Israel. They will be a nation before him forever. Now, if you're going to tell me forever doesn't mean forever, then I'm going to tell you that when you say you're saved forever, you're not saved forever. But my God does not lie. You are saved forever, and Israel will forever exist. Okay, Roger? If all those came to pass and they were true, wouldn't that be the end of everything? Yes. He says <laughs> if all those were done away with, the sun, the moon, the stars, the ocean waves, wouldn't that be everything done away with? Yes. Yes. But even when God makes a new heavens and a new earth in the eternity future mm -hmm. that we only have a bare sketch of, I know that the nation goes on. The Israel right. goes on. And I believe other nations do too. It sounds like it from our scriptures. That blows me away also. He, he takes the nations and takes them into eternity future. But the same way, hey, if I believe that he can take the humans as they filled up the earth that have repopulated that are believers and, and he's going to possibly put them on another planet, make it inhabitable, and, and we have all our planets praising God, then there's there you go. There's your nations, there's your people still. You know, and yes, that we don't know exactly how God's going to do that. That's a theory. That's an idea. But I do know God said that He's making a new heavens and a new earth. He talks about an eternity future that He has already planned. 
He just didn't give us a map because look at we can't swallow all he gave us now. We're taking all our lives to learn what he gave us to this point. Why do we need something so much further out that we'd waste our time trying to figure that one out? God wants our attention here. Yes, Laura. But then, because the next thousand years, there's not going to be much um, sin or there I mean, won't people, be. I mean, nations fighting and stuff like that. Right. I mean, there won't be during the thousand year reign. There will not be much open, rampant sin. There will not be nations warring against each other. Because when you have one who is quick to mete out justice, you're going to be obedient. Example I'll give you, third world countries where they chop off your hand if you're caught stealing, ask how much theft goes on in that country. And they'll tell you next to nothing. You know, you see somebody get their hand detached, you're not going to go do what they did. You, you, you're going to back up. You know, I, I pray for our country to come back to laws that will stop all the thieving that we see going on. It's constant, and they're doing it because they get away with it. There's no penalty, so they think. So when you see that kind of quick, justice and and i say justice because i'm not saying whether that is or not but when the lord is ruling he will you know what he says is their consequence excuse me it will fit the crime it will be what they deserve well people are going to see that and they're going to say okay i'm not going to show outwardly that i don't like this and i don't want to go along i'm rebelling in my heart but i'm smart enough i'm not going to stick my neck out on that line so they're going to go along with it as if they are a, with the Lord, as if they're in agreement. At the end of the thousand years, when they're given a chance to show what is in their heart, when Satan is going to go through the face of this earth, and he's going to say, all of you who don't like him, who you don't want Jesus for your ruler, who you don't want to do it that way, Follow me. It's on. We're going to go. We're going to dethrone him. We're going to set me up, and you can be part of my kingdom, and who knows what he promises them. But the sad note, it says that so many follow him that they can't be counted. That blows me away. When the Lord is here ruling and reigning, and they still don't love him and want to stay true to him. That, that heartbreaking, heartbreaking. But those are the ones that will come up with Satan. They'll come up. At the breadth of the earth, I believe that Satan's coming against the earthly throne and the heavenly throne to dethrone it all, to take it all over, to set himself up, and God says, done. Satan, you go into the lake of fire and you are there forever. You will never come out. You will never torture another person. You will never be a, a, a stumbling block to anyone ever again. That's your demise. That's where you belong. He will also set up the great white throne judgment. Believers do not stand at that judgment. Great white throne is for the unsaved. The unsaved of all time. He's going to go all the way back from the first unsaved in Adam and Eve's day. And he's going to go all the way through to whatever time that is. And all of the unsaved will stand before God at great white throne judgment. The throne's out in the heavens and it'll be filled with the heavens there with them coming up. God will open the books, plural. I believe he opens the book of life. When he sees their name is not in the book of life because they never accepted the one who says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man believes in the Father except through me. Name not found there, then the books are open for their actions during their lifetime. God is going to be just as just in his judgment there, but he's going to say, you were a good person, but you rejected your Savior. So your consequence is you cannot live in my heaven. You cannot be with me because you didn't want to be with me. Here is your punishment, and he will mete out a punishment equal to that person's bad deeds through his lifetime. So one who's lived a good life but rejected will have some sort of a punishment still. Just being separated from God is punishment enough in my book because that's, that's apart from light and glory and love and joy and peace and all the rest that God is. But one that's done horrors, atrocities, who, who killed many, who led others to kill, 
who, you know, give, give me a Hitler, a Stalin, a Saddam Hussein, the, you know, all of those, they're going to suffer greater consequences. Somehow God's going to mete out something that's more just and fair. So that they will get what they deserve, in essence, is what I'm trying to say. But by a God who is right, a God who judges fairly, and a God who the, will just stand in awe and say, wow, perfect, perfect, perfect. There won't be one word that can come against that one. Once that's done, that great white throne judgment has taken place, everyone has now been meted out to their punishment, that's when we go into what we call eternity future. And that's where we just know God says, yet, I haven't shown you yet. There's so much more to come. Um, our stars, we know, tells this story. I wonder, because I know it gets rolled up at tribulation time, at the end of the tribulation, I wonder if we're going to enter into a new heavens that has a new map that's rolling out something else. But what I do know is this will never be repeated. Never a lie will enter in. Never will it go back. That's all we know is it, what goes around comes around. We know it's cycling, and we could fear that it's going to be repeated one day. No, God promised us never a lie will enter in. Never will this come again. All through eternity, it will be perfect, perfect peace, glorious, in His presence forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. If I thought this could, we'd come back to this, I couldn't stand it. But there's no fear and no worries. God's got a, a wow plan for us out there. Can't wait to see. Can't wait to find out. I feel like, you know, it's a little child that's been told how great Disneyland is. They don't have a clue. And then they go to Disneyland and they love it all and they want to go again and again and again. Well, I feel like we don't really have a clue. We've just heard a little bit what it's like. But we really can't comprehend it because we've never experienced anything like it. And when we get a taste of it, we're going to want to go again and again and again and again. And, and we'll never run out of that enthusiasm, that joy, being in His presence forever. Wow. Wow. All I can say is, oh my God. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 11, uh, to back up my point with more than one scripture. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to save you. For I will destroy completely all the nations where I've scattered you, only I will not destroy you completely. But I will chasten you or chasten you justly and will by no means leave you unpunished. So Israel, yes, you're going to go out to the woodshed. You're going to get what you deserve for being um, uh, uh, disobedient. But he doesn't say any more than a parent who is punishing a child is sending that child away and trying to say that child's not mine? No. He's correcting the child because the child is his. I don't go correct your children, I correct my children. So it just shows they belong all the more. And my final will be from Isaiah, Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 66. So you have out of the mouth of two witnesses, two prophets, you have out of the mouth of the new scriptures also, the scriptures in the new covenant, in the British Hadashah, the New Testament, um, but Isaiah 66 and verse 22 says, For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, and that's what I've just been talking about, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. So God's saying, I got new heavens and new earth, and they go on, they endure, they, they're forever, so are you. Israel, you go on forever. And hallelujah, not in the state you're in today but in a state that God wanted for you from the beginning had you stayed in obedience to Him. And at that point in that eternity future, disobedience will never come in and mar the picture. What a plan. I'll, I'll tell you, if you, you know, if you catch a glimpse of this eternal plan of the ages, if you think it through from Adam to today, let alone to the future, wow, what a God. You know, that's why people have trouble believing and trusting God for something and tell them, your God's too small. You don't know God. You get a glimpse of how big, how great, how mind-boggling, how wow our God is. How does he have 7 billion people on the face of this earth? 
can hear what every conversation is. Here's my cry in English. Here's that one's cry in Hebrew. Here's this one crying out in Arabic and that one in, in Spanish and all these different languages all at the same time not only hears them, but has already put an answer in motion before they even cried out. And when you see the perfect timing in your life in a detail, remember Isaac came at that point in time. Yeshua Jesus came at that point in time. When something happens in your life at that moment where you just know God brought it all together, worked with this person and their whole life, this person and their circle of circumstances, brought it all together to do this in your life in split second timing, and he's doing that simultaneously all over the face of this globe. Wow. That's the mastermind. We think we're smart with our computers and we call our phones smart. Not compared to my God. That phone's only as good as the hand that's programming it. <laughs> so amazing God, amazing grace. He has a plan. Let's move in before we do finish today with Genesis chapter 25 and get it started. So we have in verse 1, this is, by the way, more than three years after Sarah's death because we know that Isaac was 37 when she died. That's in chapter 23 and verse 1. And we know that she had him when she was 90. So if he's 40 when he marries Rivka, Rebecca, which happens in chapter 25 and verse 20, then we know that this is three years after Sarah has died. We're at Isaac age 40 now. Um, and if you want to sneak down and look at verse 20, you will read, And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, Rivka, the daughter of Bethuel, the heir man of Pananaram, the sister of Levon, the heir man, to be his wife. So it spells out who she is, where she came from, all of that. It, it makes it very, very clear there. So... Um, He's 40. We've got three years since um, Sarah has passed away. And what happens? Abraham took another wife. So he didn't bury Sarah, and before it got, that got cold, he turned around and married somebody else. No, it was three years before he married one, and her name was Keturah. Now, from chapter 23 and verse 19, it looks like Abraham is living in Hebron, in Hebron. That's where he buried Sarah, remember, the cave of Machpelah and Hebron, in Hebron. So he's probably there. We've not heard differently, and you'll see why I bring that out in a bit. He took another wife. Um, probably he was lonely. He had 100 plus years. Well, he didn't marry her, Sarah, at zero. But, you know, he had so many years with her. The same way that Isaac was grieved and was missing his mom and he wanted a bride for her, I think that in his loneliness, he was wanting someone for himself. Yitzhak and Rivka had moved south. They moved to where it's called La Roy. It's not far from Hebron. They're both in the desert area, southern Israel. But we see in verse 11, um, that God had blessed his son Isaac. Isaac lived by Beer Lahoy Roy. And I'll talk about the meaning of the name when we get there. Um, we also see in chapter 24, back up one chapter and verse 62, right at the end, we see there um, Isaac had come back from a journey to Beer Lahoy Roy, for he was living in the Negev. Negev is a southern desert in Israel. So it sounds like, you know, Isaac's got his own place. Abraham's got his own place. They're not living next door neighbors. They're, you know, Abraham's got some loneliness going on. And in his loneliness, he has met Keturah and he has chosen to marry her. So, um, and, and um, it says that he took another wife. In First Chronicles 1 and verse 32, it calls her his concubine. Concubine was like a wife without the wifely um, um, privileges. You know, um, she's a less than. She's she's better than a slave, but she's less than a wife with all the promises that go for a wife. And in regard to God's covenant promises, that went through Abraham and Sarah to Isaac. Keturah is coming in. She'll be blessed by Abraham, but she's not coming into those promises, those covenant promises that will go on with Isaac and down through the line. So um, 
So it's probably why First Chronicles called her a concubine. But a concubine was a lot like a wife. Um, it didn't have the moral stigma that we give it today. Um, it, 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 you can't say it's an inferior wife or a secondary wife. You, but again, not meant with uh, like looking down on that. It just it was fact then. Um, under the late Roman period, the time concubine became substitute for mistress, and we go on down where the name isn't um, as nice, as, as good. Respectable. As respectable, thank you. Much better word, as respectable. <laughs> Let me point out to you, I'll not look up the scriptures. They are in your cross-references, and I'll speak them for the sake of the video. Uh, but let me show you, Gideon, Gideon had many wives. He had 71 sons. <laughs> he had a lot of concubines. Judges 8, <clears throat> verses 30 and 31, you'll read that. Saul had concubines. Chapter, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel, chapter 3, and verse 7. David had more than one wife. Chapter um, 5 in 2 Samuel still, and verse 13. Solomon. In 1 Kings 11 and verse 3, he had 300 wives. We know that by the time Solomon's done, he has 300 that are called wives and 700 that are called concubines. A thousand. He might have thought he was having fun playing. He liked the girls and he liked, you know, bring, uh, he wanted everyone he met. He liked everyone. Oh, I like that one. Oh, I like that one. Oh, I like that one. But what did they do? They brought in their adulterous ways and led him astray. So it was not the best plan. Rehoboam, one of, of Solomon's sons, he was king of Judah, uh, of Judah. In 2 Chronicles 11, 21, we have that Rehoboam had 18 wives, 60 concubines, 28 sons, and 60 daughters. How would you like to keep up with just a birthday card for each one? <laughs> Be a little bit hard. So Keturah is like a concubine in that sense, a secondary wife, however you want to put it. Just know it's not meant with, with a derogatory connotation. Keturah probably was one of the Egyptian maids of Abraham's, Abraham's household. Um, don't know it for a fact, but it's very likely the name gives the, yields itself to being Egyptian. And we know Hagar was brought in. We don't know who else was brought in. Um, she could have been also one of the daughters, even, because this is probably 65 years after he gained the Egyptian maids when he went down into Egypt, when we think that he got Hagar, because, you know, we know she was contemporary with Abraham. So if this is 65 years later, easily she could have been one that was born to one of his Egyptian maids. And being born in his household, she'd be more eligible to come into a wifely position like this. However, whoever she was, she was young enough that she was of childbearing age, and we read here that she gave birth to six sons. And I could slaughter their names for you. Zimron, Jokshan, Madan, Midian, Ishbach, and Shua. If you meet them one day in heaven, you can ask them how well I did with their names. <laughs> um, let's see. Verses 2 through 4, we're going to get all the way to his grandson. So she had six sons, six the number of man, and it's the sons of the flesh. Man is flesh. They are going to spell trouble from the sound of their names. Let me tell you that Zimron was celebrated. That's what it meant because he was firstborn. But Jokshan, that meant Fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R, playing foul. It wasn't playing fair. Okay, and these two were thought to be identified with cities on the Red Sea, west of Mecca, in Arabia. So again, another reason to believe they were of Egyptian descent. Medan, M-E-D-A-N, Medan, however I should be saying it, his name meant contention, and Midian meant strife. So you've got Fowler and contention and strife. Ishbak, the word comes from Ish for man, Baka for weeping, crying. So he was the crying man, he was the weeping man, and Shua's name meant depression. So, and these last two, Ishbak and Shua, are thought to be identified with the cities or tribes in Edom, from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. So, like southern Israel going down even further south and on um, the east of the Dead Sea. But what we do see 
pass their names. The fact that she birthed six sons is obviously when God restored Abraham's ability to have seed and produce, it, it stayed good. It wasn't a one-time shot and he could only give birth to Isaac. He was able to make his wife pregnant six times and give her six sons. Um, yeah, wow. For a late start, he did good. Yeah, for a late start, he did good. <laughs> um, he's 140 years at least now, um, and his body was considered as good as dead at 100 years. We read that in Hebrews 11, 12, and Romans 4, 19. I'm not looking them up because we are familiar. We have talked about them, and they are in your cross-references. But they talk about his, Abraham's body being as good as dead, but God rejuvenated him. So, we also see the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in chapter 17 and verse 6, where he said, out of Abraham would come nations, not just Israel, but there would be nations. And by the time the sixth son is born, it's probably at least 50 years since God restored his procreative power so that these nations could come out of him. Now, I can go through, and I'm not going to do it in depth. I'm going to tell you you've got your references and look up as much as you want. But when we look at verse 2, we look at some of these names, and I already mentioned Midian. The Midianites could be descendants from them. Midian was about 100 years older than Yosef in Genesis 37. It'll take us time to get there. But Genesis 37, 21, um, the Midianites are the ones who bought Joseph, they were the enemies of Israel. They were going on the trade route when his brother sold him into slavery. You read it also in Numbers 31, verses 1 through 3, and verse um, 16. Gideon fought against the Midianites in Judges chapter 6 through 8. And often we see the Midianites allied with the Ishmaelites, like in Genesis 37, with the Moabites, another enemy of Israel, in Numbers 25, with the Amalekites in Judges 6. So we see them mixing in and being enemies of Israel through time. If this is where they started, and it, it could be. We do know Moab, um, the descendants that uh, came out of that area, uh, lots two um, sons by his two girls after Sodom and Gomorrah, we know that one led to the Ammonites and one led to, the, I think it's the Midianites, if I remember right. So they definitely stemmed from there, but they could have had these older roots. Um, but we also see Moshe, Moses, marries a Midianite when he's on the backside of the desert. Um, so obviously those were still some of Abraham's seed, just not the line of the promised seed. Remember, Ishmael was part of Abraham's seed, but not line of the promised seed. So we just see him with other nations being established from him. You can read that also in Exodus and in Shemot, Exodus chapter 2, verses 16 and 21, where Moses marries a Midianite. So when we get into verse 3, and we have Jokshan, father Sheba, and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim, Letushim, and Leunim. Hello. I'd call them, you know, what? Um, Louis, Letty, and Jock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, these were the grandsons of Abraham again. Uh, well, the sons of Dedan, the ones that come from them, are the grandsons. But again, we're just seeing that, that Abraham had other progeny, just not of the promised line. So the ver verse 4, the sons of Midian, again, these would be grandchildren. Ephah, Ephah, Hanuk, Abida, Eldaah, all of these were the sons of Keturah. So sorry, they were sons, then grandsons came from them. But verse 5 is where we get back on focus. Now Abraham gave all that he had to Yitzhak, to Isaac. Isaac, remember, is a type of Yeshua Jesus who is made heir of all things by his father. Hebrews 1, 2 tells us, in fact, I'll read it for you. And we read it in other scriptures also, but right now I'll just read Hebrews 1 and verse 2. And here we read, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and many ways, in, last, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And Romans 8 tells us that, that Yeshua is heir of all things and that we're joint heirs with him. So... Uh, my point here to, to bring it out is Isaac being a picture of 
Yeshua, here we see him become heir of all things. So Abraham had many more children, but Isaac's his heir. And Isaac is the one who gets the promise and the promised covenant and all that goes along with it. So back in Genesis 25 and verse 6, we read, But to the sons of his concubines, to the sons of the secondary wives, or wife and, and those who came on, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Yitzhak eastward to the land of the east. Okay, he gave them adequate provision. He gave them gifts. He blessed them. He gave them probably a reasonable start on their own. Probably gave them flocks, herds, you know, whatever, and basically sent them off because you're going to see it's, it's too much here. And they would be fighting in contention, and he wanted Isaac to have the blessing of, of what was here. So he sends them away. It would keep, it would limit the strife, but yet he sends them out with, you know, with gifts. So he gives gifts to his sons and his grandsons only to Isaac. Does he give his property? He gives Isaac his authority, and he gives Isaac his spiritual possessions, those that God is promising to pass down. Isaac Yitzhak was his legal son and the one to whom all the promises of God were to be given. So he's doing right. He's giving what should go to Isaac, and the others are still being blessed, but it's... Is a less than. And when they go east, they probably go to the area of Arabia. There they migrate, they have intermarriages, and the sons um, probably even got together with sons of Ishmael uh, because he was out there, sons of Lot, sons of Esau. Um, we're going to see, you know, th these other lines, we'll see them, you know, down the road. Um, we know Ham had children, we know uh, Japheth had children, but we know Shem was the line that we were concerned about because that's the line that led to um, the promised line. So we're just basically being given the fact that there were other groups and other what will be nations, what will be families, and they're being sent out. And um, Avram has protected and given, again, those spiritual possessions, the land, his name of authority, everything to Isaac and Isaac only. So these people are the ones that uh, make up the Arab world? Yes. Yes, they make up the Arab world. Yes, we're seeing roots for them that are, well, not even just roots because we could go back to Noah's time. But, you know, to his three sons we saw, you know, the Arab line came, comes through Han. But, but yes, these are the Arab peoples. Yes. So right there is where we're going to stop because I see our clock. Um, we didn't go far in chapter 25, but I think we traveled far today, covered a lot of territory. Um, we'll see the Avraham, um, his life, the blessings that go on. Um, well, I actually, let me stand corrected. What I'm trying to say is Avraham's coming to an end. I get one more week with him. I, I, I always love to hold on to the ones we're studying. So it's hard for me to watch them depart from us. We get a whole other week, but Abraham will depart. We'll go on with Isaac. We'll see what Isaac does in his lifetime with his father not in the picture. And we'll go on from there. We'll, we'll look at a lot of where these nations are developing. That'll go pretty fast. Um, I'm trying to think what I, uh, we're going to get into. Oh, I know what. Okay. From there, you're going to see, we've talked about the Arab nations and them going out and them having, you know, their families. But what about Isaac? And what about Rivka? When do they get to? And if you don't know the answer, you can read ahead. But how soon do they get their first baby? We know Abram and Sarah waited a long time. What about Isaac and Rebecca? Was it quick? Was there a delay? I can guarantee you they're going to have more than one. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know what I'm hinting at, they, uh, really they get like, doubly blessed. Like when I go home and read it, it doesn't sound as good as when you say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the details. Well, I give you a little research and I kind of hopefully bring it to life because I pray all the time, Lord, let me help it because it is alive. It's the word of God. It's not, it's, this isn't just a dead history book of dead people. You know, this is the, the life that is the word of God and it carries on. So I'm glad if you like it better here. <laughs> but uh, we're going to get into some interesting times with uh, um, with the babies that are coming. Because uh, 
Oops, I just slipped. I said it in plural. Hmm, I wonder why. <laughs> so I'll close in prayer real quick. Lord God, we do stand in awe, just absolutely in awe at your mastermind of how you can plan through the ages, how you planned it before you began it, how you existed in eternity past, and how we'll exist in eternity future with you. It is beyond human ability to understand. We do take it by faith that you've proven yourself true time and again. Nothing has failed of all your good words. So we know this is truth. We know we have a future and a hope that's literally out of this world. Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us the final chapters. Thank you for the encouragement to know the end is good, that it is eternity with you forever for those who believe, and that never a sin will enter in again. Lord, we just rejoice in your, your great plans but we thank you personally, too, that you chose to save each one of us here today, that, that you drew us to you because we don't come without you drawing us first, and we, we just can't thank you and praise you enough. Go with each one this week. Bless them through the week. Bring us back together to learn again at your feet. But may we absorb it and really uh, continue to meditate on and receive the fullness of these scriptures we've talked about today. And again, Lord, we just... We bow before you. You are worthy of all praise and honor and glory forever and ever. And we say hallelujah, amen, and amen.